Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcoming you all to the spectacular Epsilon 2023. I am Chetna Dhongde, Joint Secretary at IEEE SIS GST. Hello, and I am Samyan Zoshi, Creative Head at IEEE SIS GST. Uh, we are delighted to be your host for the third iteration of our flagship event, that is Epsilon 2023, wherein our main goal is to provide an organized learning atmosphere and share technical information surrounding the theme, the galaxy of intelligence. I'm sure the recent session, Nero AI, has expanded your knowledge and opened up new avenues for exploration. We hope that this session as well will provide you with a wealth of information and introduce you to many new concepts. Now, under CS track, we are going for our very first talk session titled Eyes of the Future. Also, before we begin, just a little information for the attendees. The task and the quizzes we have prepared for each day uh, of our symposium will test your knowledge of the topics presented in each session. Each action is worth a certain number of points. So to compete on the scoreboard, make sure you attempt those quizzes and secure a top position on the scoreboard. Uh, now let us begin with our most awaited session by welcoming our first guest speaker for the day. For today's session, we have with us Mr. Varun Prakash, who brings with him five years of experience in developing machine learning and computer vision based technological solutions for multiple industries and startups. His interest lies in solving problems at the inter intersection of computer vision, robotics and NLP. In his previous company, he solved challenging problems in machine learning to provide solutions to enhance the lives of children with autism. He has proved track record of training and deploying novel deep learning and computer vision models on real world data. Mr. Varun has also gained extensive experience in implementing large scale data processing model training. He has spent considerable time working on many computer vision and robotics challenges and has published numerous research papers. Sir has received his Bachelor's of Engineering in Electronics and Communication from SJCE Mysore. Welcome, sir. We are thrilled to have you here today with us. Before we start, I would like to inform the session will be live for about 120 minutes, of which last 30 minutes would be dedicated to the quiz. The link for the quiz will be shared in the live chat. So without further ado, I would like Mr. Varun to begin the session by casting some light on computer vision and guiding the audience through extensive area of computer vision. Uh, so you can begin with the session. Thank you, Samihan uh, and Chetana for the warm welcome. Uh, and I would like to also welcome all the attendees uh, and also would like to thank for, uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak about very interesting topic of you know, computer vision and deep learning. Without further ado, I'll, I'm gonna present my screen. So uh, first, first most, when we talk about computer vision, so uh, wh what is this computer vision, right? So it's basically, several methods that we want to you know teach computers for for you know visual interpretation of the surroundings so uh, it's very intuitive for us and very easy for us thanks to evolution how we think about our surroundings but it's really really hard for computers to you know uh, make our surround and to make understand uh, various you know visual representation of our surroundings so uh, I've called it eyes of the future. Definitely most of the models that we would see now are capable of much more than uh, what humans can do. So it's definitely, uh, you know, images and videos will be part of part of our life as we uh, move further. And uh, so this is the agenda that we have for, for an hour, hour um, of the session. So, We'll first talk about history of computer vision. I'll brief about, you know, what's image processing and kernels. And we have uh, a lot of problems and important tasks in computer vision. And uh, later we'll, we'll move on to 
solving the image classification task and what are all the challenges and we i would give you an you know uh, industry's perspective on how the models will be trained and later we would see one of the popular architecture which is called as convolution neural networks and later we would see most of the uh, you know applications of cnns and we have a couple of case studies and we will also see how cnns could be you know uh, could be attacked or how we can make it more robust so uh, computer vision comes from uh, you, from the ancient ages to be frank and you have a constellation of many uh, you know branches of uh, science and computer science mathematics and engineering uh, that contribute uh, to computer vision and computer vision is in turn uh, is applied in uh, many of the branches that you would see such as physics engineering mathematics psychology and computer science if you talk about physics uh, you have optics um, which which is a way how you would you know describe objects and a study on the lights right and you have image processing how you would make uh, a surrounding or uh, the image that you are uh, able to perceive uh, for the computers and you have speech and nlp uh, nowadays you might see speech and nlp working along with the computer vision which we call it as visual and language models uh, and computer vision benefits a lot uh, these days for, for the past couple of two years i guess uh, from the nlp and the speech side and robotics obviously uh, is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, domain and computer vision you know provides eyes to robots so it's able to percept robots can able to percept act uh, and you know control uh, you know uh, the environment right and you have machine learning uh, where we would see computer vision and machine learning there's a very thin line nowadays and you have information retrieval for example if you can consider uh, you have google lens right uh, you capture a pic and you get uh, similar objects or items right where we uh, where we send a pic to the cloud and we would get information about the picture and computer vision also part of many of the algorithms from the computer science and uh, you know uh, for the past few years have been working on uh, neuroscience and cognitive sciences uh, to you know diagnose uh, behaviors in autism which which is again an intersection between neuroscience and computer vision so as you can see i'm sure that uh, studying computer vision and working as a researcher in computer vision would greatly benefit to many many branches in the uh, of engineering and science and technology and it would greatly help uh, you know society in a larger way at first uh, first most uh, we would see how you know basic uh, image came came about right so in the early you know probably the 16th century in the high renaissance period um, there was something called as camera obscura where uh, which translate to a dark room or an uh, you know dark chamber which is basically a camera this is a uh, this is a you know a parent you can call it as to our digital cameras and in this particular uh, camera obscura so you would have an uh, a hole which we call it as pin hole and any light passing through the hole uh, which captures the you know information of the image which we product pro pro projected in the background on uh, on a wall or an you know an, on a fill right so uh what you might answer uh no uh if you have uh studied the optics the image would be inverted right but camera obscura was uh very much used in ancient times even from da vinci and uh, uh many other peoples to study how how images work and uh what are the source of images how we perceive things in the you know environment for uh for example 
you know they were using sun uh, and solar eclipses to to project the uh, you know light rays from sun and uh, you know solar flares and sunspots at that time and there were many other versions of uh, you know the camera obscura that people uh, used to carry as a portable device for example artists in order to trace the image uh, it's like you can you can stand in front of it and the artist would you know trace an outline or draw your figure it, it usually used as a tool for artists and you know galileo also used uh, it, you know galileo also used for uh, his experiments on telescope and da vinci also used uh, for many of his research and uh, one of the prominent experiment that we see uh, in the 20th century was uh, this Hubble and Wiesel uh, experiment. Um, again, they were trying to understand, uh, you know, human brain and how our visual cortex works. If you consider uh, cats being mammals, their brain, you know, structure is considering it's very similar to humans. They consider cat as a test subject and they inserted electrodes to uh, its back and this cat was shown uh, uh, a couple of you know oriented edges what they call it probably uh, you could consider this as um, you have a you have a screen and you have a patterned light that is falling on the screen and the cat used to see this and they used to collect these signals from you know the visual cortex of the uh, cat's brain you should also consider the visual cortex in human brains also makes up for around like you know for uh for 50 percent of uh, uh you know of the area uh, that also signifies that how important our um visual perception is about so once the cat you know observes different patterns uh they observe a spike for a particular uh you know oriented edges uh, that the cat has seen and they are quite amazed about it and when they change the position of the you know electrodes to a different parts of the brain uh, in inside in the neural uh, visual cortex itself uh, for different other horizontal and vertical rectangular slits it was able to you know uh, the neurons were activated so uh, this was the you know very first understanding that our neurons are you know not you not all neurons get you know fired or uh, you know triggered for a particular visual input but there are dedicated neurons in visual cortex which would uh, which when sees a particular pattern uh, they gets fired and then uh, that information will be you know propagated via axons to synapse and then the brain would uh, understand uh, the image right and um, so this was a first this was first of its kind uh, about this observation we would need to understand that uh, the response to light orientation and uh, uh, the orientation of the edges uh, is the one that caused you know uh, a spike in the in the response in the electrical response so we will talk about how this actually correlates to our actual neural networks and a couple of other models that we still use this idea. And then uh, one of the papers in the 1970s, they discussed and brought uh, the first kind of you know, framework, how uh, an image could, you know, how our surroundings can be understood. Uh, it might be image or uh, it might be a 3D, uh, you know, understanding of, of the surroundings so if you consider just the input image input image are perceived basically as intensities uh, those are numbers and uh, these images would you know further has uh, you know these blobs edges surfaces and group of lines the background is coarse or textured and we also have you know 2.5 d kind of you know 2.5 tech uh, it's a kind of pseudo, you know, 3D kind of uh, uh, pseudo 3D kind of 
you know understanding of the image where you have the local surface and you no know, discontinuity in the depth and surface if you see this image you would definitely get to know that you know the ball is still you know front and uh, the background is quite distant which gives a pseudo kind of a 3d uh, perception but it's not actually a, a 3d right and once we you know do all this processing we might be able to arrive at a 3d model uh, where if we consider you know actual volumetric uh, you know properties of any kind of object so this was the first kind of framework that david had provided at first uh, in order to model uh, the objects or the surroundings uh, uh, around us now i'd like to uh, just explain you about how you would basically understand these uh, edges or you know blobs or surfaces right you would see uh, on the top uh, top left uh, images are basically pixels and these pixels have intensities and these intensities would translate to a uh, you know a black or white or a grayish kind of patterns and uh, you would see uh, there are different mathematical operations that you can do and once you do those operations you would uh, get the output as required for example on the right you would see uh, for the blurring uh, for the blurring operations you would need to multiply by a set uh, you know specific matrix we call this matrix as kernel and once you you know it's basically multiply uh, each pixel of the image uh, it's basically a sum over the neighborhood of the you know uh, the pixel in consideration weighted by the weighted by the uh, you know the kernel uh, elements i would like to see this uh, show you this in in real time you see an image here and uh, once we you know uh, we have different operations so typically in the early image processing people used to design these kernels which you would see is this three cross three matrix and uh, this kernel would be used to you know, traverse the image and get uh, you know visual features so features here are you know probably the edges the outlines or group of pixels which we call call it as blobs and you might see uh, if you want to blur uh, an image you would use this particular you know, kernel embossing would look something like this um, you have you can get the outline you can sharpen the image so as you might consider uh, you know this might work for certain particular task so how you would but you know edge processing is not just one task that we are doing in computation there are there might be many other tasks so that's how uh, you know image processing and pattern recognition move towards you know deep learning where we don't need to now explicitly define these kernels uh, so these kernels are basically the weights inside your neural networks uh, which will be learned uh, during your training process so uh, you could see uh, the change in the image once you uh, change the 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 numbers of your kernel let's just play around with it and you would see a a small red uh, matrix that i'm traversing and you would see in real time uh, once it multiplies with you know the group of pixels get summed over and multiplied uh, with the corresponding weights that you would provide and that would be replaced by a uh, into that that particular position of the pixel on the right and uh, sooner or later in 1980s people started working on uh, you know uh, how to detect edges and solve tasks for example there was one 
paper from David uh, in order to count, uh, you know, the, the coins or currencies. And he used most of the operators that we saw, which were like edge and the you know, contours or the, uh, you know, uh, the edge detection or the corner detection algorithms. But uh, later we understood that there will be a different kind of tasks that we need to solve. Uh, for example, whether it is possible to group pixels uh, depending upon, uh, you know, its neighboring pixels. So consider it will be really hard to, you know, uh, extract the, uh, you know, segment the person, but it's easy, easy for you to group the background pixels. Once you group the background pixels, you should be able to, you know, uh, extract the uh, outline of the person. Um, so they proposed something called as normalized cut uh, by Jitendra Malik and she in 1997. This was a graph based algorithm where it built, uh, will say uh, it's a it's a graph theory based and it will it builds a vertices and nodes uh, on the particular image and it groups the pixels accordingly. As you can see, uh, the pixels are very well grouped, but you would also see some mismatches where the intensities are quite you know uh, matches the intensities uh, on the head you might see the intensity would match the background similarly you could see uh, you know how they could easily segment the umbrellas and um, you know you might see the people and shadows are quite difficult they are uh, grouped into a a single segment Later came uh, in 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 the in early 21st century, uh, Wyler and Jones face detection algorithm. This is one of the most popular, um, you know, face detection algorithm that could actually work in real time at those days on an uh, you know CPU. And uh, the idea was really simple. You would use you know the rectangular slits. Those are again the kernels. Uh, here we call it as har uh, kernel, which they slid over the entire image, and this would detect the faces. And once you detect the faces, you would draw a bounding box. So you might see uh, this would at earlier stages would only only worked on frontal you know, images, but they used AdaBoost algorithm, uh, a popular machine learning algorithm, um, to also Make it robust to you know side poses. Uh, you could parallelly run different face detection algorithm, uh, probably in parallel, right? And uh, you know one would uh, work for frontal face, and you could train you know uh, these hard kernels for uh, side pose, uh, side pose of the images of the faces. And later uh, again, David uh, came up with. Uh, an algorithm for instead of you know this was computationally expensive uh, the previous algorithms right um, and it's good it's a good idea if you just get most important features from the images than the you know uh, just the edges or blobs or the entire pixels um, then came the SIF, which is a uh, scale invariant feature transform uh, which is robust to, as you can see in the picture, to rotation and you know scale uh, variance. And uh, this was particularly used to you know match given a set of images whether you could get the same images or visual location understanding. If you provide a location and you give give different uh, views of the same location, whether you can tell uh, the the particular location. Uh, are the same. As you can, one thing that you would observe is the quality of the images is getting good as the, you know, uh, digital uh, cameras, uh, you know, started capturing more and more images, and the, all these images were put into put put on the internet. Uh, another method that came was histogram of gradients. So basically, this would uh, you know, you would have uh, an histogram, which is a frequency distribution of all your intensities, and you would get a gradient information at 
uh, each pixel level it was easily uh, able to you know detect humans this was the first you know person kind of detection algorithm and then uh, came deformable part model where you can also segment different uh, parts of the body later uh, in 2006 to 2012 there was a uh, so the computer vision researchers understood that we need to somehow benchmark all these models all these algorithms that we are coming up against an uh, particular data set and then the pascal visual object recognition uh, object challenge uh, was introduced for around you know 20 object categories which involved train aeroplane person the idea was to also track track and benchmark the newer models or algorithms that the people would build at the same time also you know collect and have this collaborative nature in you know collecting different images and build more data sets uh, so that we could make this algorithm more robust as you can see this one one of the tasks was to identify this is an uh, image classification task so given an image whether we you are whether the algorithm can be able to tell uh, the components of the image here the major part of the image is train aeroplane and person but in real life uh, if you consider self-driving car you know it's it's complete 360 you know view that you will get and you might need to you know detect each person and probably segment them pixel wise later uh, they collected more and more images uh, about 40 million images of 22000 categories were collected this was one of the you know uh, uh, breakthrough event in deep learning uh, because of this uh, data set and the challenge uh, which uh, which comes in the in the later years people were able to switch from traditional pattern recognition and image processing or you know classical machine learning model based approaches to deep learning as you can see, uh, some of the categories were, uh, you know, uh, has subcategories, which were, so, you know, animals has bird, fish, mammals, and plants has tree, flower, food, and materials. And, uh, you know, you have the structures and uh, artifacts uh, and much more. Um, at that time, it will be really difficult. Uh, so this work was mostly done by Stanford and in collaboration with many other universities where people uh, literally you know collected uh, billions of images and then curated each and every image and if you are talking about supervised learning you also need to you know label these images to a particular category which is very you know it's an herculean herculean task uh, at that time uh, nowadays we would have you know crowdsourcing and uh, annotation pipelines which are very easy to build and even you know extract images but at that time it was really hard and once the image net data set was created uh, uh, people uh, opened up a challenge called large scale visual recognition challenge um, the idea is to again you know build better models uh, but this time it's thousand object classes and with around 1.5 uh, you know million images you can see one of the output here uh, you would show the algorithm your image and um, you would also have a label which is we call it as ground truth which is steel drum here what you might have seen the major component is steel drum but you would also see a person or a child here right uh, it's a basically a multi class uh, you know classification problem so here were the some of the results of uh, the challenge uh, on the y-axis you would see these are the error rates and these are the different algorithms that researchers came up with drastically from 2010 to 2015 or 12 uh, you see there's uh, uh, there's is exponential reduction in uh, the error rate and uh, uh, in 2015 it also you know the error rate surpassed human evaluation the human evaluation were actually the phd students who actually built the 
ground truth for uh, you know uh, this recognition challenge and most of the algorithms are you know uh, surpass or uh, in in level with the human intelligence for this particular task so if you consider uh, what is the bas basic task that we uh, that the researcher were solving so you have uh, you know if you if i in digital cameras if i just take an image of an eye whether you are able to it's a left image if left eye or an right eye or whether just you can tell if it if at all it's an eye right you can use image classifier models to uh, to uh, you know understand what food items are there that you are looking at probably uh, how much calorie uh, each, each image you know uh, food item is uh, these models are now kind of prevalent um, and open source too and the other use cases that you think of image classification is uh, you know uh, you you go to a museum you capture an image you get the details on your mobile or a tablet and uh, you might have seen in amazon once you purchase an order you could actually see in an ar and an vr um, i think it's an ar right uh, where you can uh, point to an empty space in your room and you can actually project that image uh, into the space so that before you you can buy and you could also build 3d models from from your uh, surroundings so these are some of the classification problems that uh, uh, we will talk about uh, some of the other you know use cases in computer vision were object detection action classification image captioning so uh, image image classification is classifying an image to one of the categories but the object detection involves you know uh, providing a bounding box and also classifying uh, the particular object inside the bounding box. These are very much required for you know self-driving cars, uh, where we need to you know uh, distinguish the pedestrians, the car, um, and the road lanes, probably the stop signs, um, and other traffic signs, and probably the other surroundings too, such as. Uh, you know, light poles and um, pedestrian walking spaces. You also have, you know, if you look at this image, there's a kid uh, with a hammer. At first, without, you know, just computer vision models or deep learning models, you would just have this kind, this level of understanding. But thanks to, uh, you know, language, uh, you know, language models, which are also contributing to computer vision, you could basically now create an image caption for a particular image. For example, uh, this might be uh, a, a, a toddler uh, wearing a green shirt, holding an amber, uh, holding a hammer, and uh, probably uh, you know doing some work. So uh, with the language, you know, as one of the uh, modality uh, while training a neural network we could you know ex extract you know rich information of our surroundings um there's another example on the right where there is you need to also you know understand that a person is on the bike and there are basically two objects now right uh, this might be very uh, very easy for us but uh, you might understand uh, computers might only understand you know, numbers and uh, you should come up with a model how you would basically make computers understand and also make decisions in 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 self-driving cars right uh, on the environment in the 1998 and 2012 there were two uh, major uh, you know breakthrough in in deep learning uh, at that time uh, it was called convolution neural networks but later many different kind of neural networks um, were introduced in uh, 1998 at bell labs uh, jan lucan was working on an important problem where if at all you can 
uh, you know, you have postal addresses and uh, you know numbers. Can you do a digit classification or a uh, letter classification? Uh, so they came up with an with the, with this idea of uh, convolution, and uh, we would see in detail uh, what CNN is about. Uh, basically, you would have an input image, and uh, you would extract high-level features uh, as an uh, feature maps, and you would then then you would have a subsampling and fully connected, and basically at the output you should be able to tell that this letter is K. Um, so if it was uh, done in 1998, so why did it take you know uh, almost two decades for us to um, you know actually deploy these models on you know different hardware or train newer models? So uh, everything boils down to the computation. At, at that time, the transistors uh, were in, 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 the, in, in the Pentium kind of architecture, if you'd consider, and we did not have access to GPUs. And only in 2012, when Krzyzewski uh, and others worked on you know, stacking deeper layers and trying to utilize GPUs. So GPUs are graphical processing units, which allow us to, you know, feed uh, video or image data, and uh, you know it has the ability to uh, parallelize uh, the computations, and uh, it will be much more faster than uh, using uh, just the CPUs at that time. And uh, also that at in 1998 uh, there were limited data sets, so they're not. Uh, you know, large scale collaboration of data set where we could build uh, robust models. And uh, it went from 10 power 7 to 10 power 14 pixels that are used in training. This is really amazing uh, to think about um, like how a neural network works. So at, uh, you know, uh, later from as soon as, you know, uh, uh, most of the models and people were uh, started the research. Uh, at first, obviously, you would understand people would try to use the kind of descriptor, the hog descriptor that we saw, and do the pooling and then use a classifier at the end. But this did, did not work well, and the accuracy was really low. And uh, then came in 2012, one of the top uh, contestants were Supervision, now called as AlexNet. Uh, which were uh, which had many layers of convolution, and you have max pooling layer and then fully collected layer, which we will talk about in the coming slides. And then Google came with its Google Net, and we have a visual geometry group from Oxford uh, having stacked multiple convolution and max pooling layers. And in 2015, uh, it was a great moment where MSRA, which is a Microsoft uh, 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 network, uh, introduced residual connections, one of the methodology which surpassed uh, you know, human uh, performance. It's not just you know, uh, uh, you know, the object or you know, image classification that we are talking about. Com computer vision also helps in many other areas, such as, for example, if you consider segmentation here, where you need to classify each and every pixel into a particular you know, class. For example, as you can see, there's a class, laptop, wall, and desk. And this is pretty much a solved problem on the top right that you would see where you can, whether you can reconstruct uh, a particular surroundings into a digital model, this can be easily done even with the photogrammetric approaches. Uh, then you have you know, action recognition, one of very uh, interesting and also challenging uh, uh, task in computer vision, which is uh, consider if you are waving, how you would make an, uh, you know model understand that you are hand waving. So uh, different people have different you know, gesture of hand waving. So how you would actually differentiate two? So you would basically collect uh, a lot of data set of short clips of p 
people waving at each other and then you would you know uh, also make neural network see you know this temporal information of how those pixels change over time and uh, you could basically there's a concept called optical flow which can use to uh, classify the action and you might have seen people are working with uh, augmented reality and virtual reality where you where one of the computer vision tasks is to uh, you know, uh, estimate the pose of the human joints and also project them into you know virtual reality or games so in uh, 2015 uh, johnson came up with a really interesting approach uh, where the bounding boxes and just the classes might not be a uh, you know might be just a naive approach to classify or describe an image here you could see uh, there's an uh, child wearing a, a red color uh, t-shirt with a blue jacket holding a racket and another boy with the blue jeans uh, holding uh, a racket so uh, Im image is a much more than just you know bounding boxes and uh, probably the classes or few words so he constructed a graphical approach a semantic you know understanding so that uh, so there might be a car and behind the car there was a uh, there's a boy and boy is wearing uh, shorts which is camouflaged and uh, um, he has a blue racket and all those uh, uh, rich you know uh, i would call semantic understanding uh, which is helpful for neural networks to learn but uh, this was soon you know to be forgotten uh, until recently in 2022 and 2023 we are doing once again you know using language models in order to describe uh, an uh, a, a part of an image and then you would use those captions as features to train another network right uh, so but, but but it is one and the same if you consider lab y uh, computer vision is still challenging so are all of the tasks are solved uh, there will be some of the tasks that might be solved but there might be uh, different you know edge cases which you would see on the left uh, this was an one of the experiment that was uh, done at fifi uh, lab uh, in stanford where uh, the participants were shown this image for a split second and they were able to remember the image and also make a, give a description in a paragraph about it for example here uh, you might at least know that they are playing in a in a field or a garden and, and a, a person in the background is watching he might not be the player and uh, there's many things if you if if they provide and if you see the image for a longer time you basically can build a story about it right but uh, for neural networks in order to comprehend uh, everything for computers will be really really hard at once so uh, at first it was uh, from 2010 to early 2020s they were solving you know uh, discrete tasks for discrete kind of problems for example uh, this task might be just to identify the person uh, or what what are, what are all their action but uh, nowadays we would see uh, a single model capable of doing multiple tasks it can do object recognition it can do segmentation it can describe an image it can also predict what might come in the future frames that we would obviously see the guy in the white would you know uh, throw the frisbee that he's holding right but on the right that you would see it will be very much difficult in these cases for the model to understand you might see uh, we, we would definitely understand that uh, the person here is not a normal person. He's, uh, he's President Obama, who is making fun of uh, a, uh, a camp, uh, his, one of his colleagues, probably, uh, where he's, uh, he's weighing his cell. And you might also observe that there's a mirror that is, uh, that is placed, and we could also see uh, you know, the reflection of Obama. Um, this is really difficult if you consider even for you know present day 
uh, models you know to describe that uh, the real scene uh, is where people are laughing uh, at uh, at the joke that was uh, uh, put on uh, on by, by by Obama, and uh, this is actually a reflection. So if you consider so, uh, we would see now uh, in detail on image classification. So if you consider just an cat, and uh, assume that uh, you have a discrete labels, and you would take a particular image and uh, you know tell that you are algorithm that it's a cat. So the algorithm would definitely understand uh, th since these images are pixels, those are intensities uh, ranging from zero to you know, two fifty five. Uh, so zero uh, depicting the uh, darkest pixel, which is black, and two fifty five would be the uh, brightest intensity, right? And uh, given an image eight hundred cross six hundred, uh, you would also have three you know, channels which are uh, red green and blue uh, so for the for computers to understand it is not always uh, necessary that you would provide uh, rgb uh, earlier works only worked on you know, grayscale images and uh, you might somehow model this particular image and given these kind of images to your algorithm uh, the algorithm would definitely do well but what if there's a viewpoint variation in the uh, in the in, uh, for the for this particular cat. So the cat would definitely not sit in a uh, uh, in, in the same position, right? In real time, and when you collect these different images at different points of time, the pixels would change. And now you would retrain your algorithm to understand how these pixel changes has happened. And you should also consider other challenges which are illumination you know uh, the, the cats are very flexible uh, there are like different forms of deformation there are also occlusion this one is really interesting at first you would not observe that it's a you know it's a tail uh, you might think it's a kind of snake or something right and there are also a lot of background clutter or camouflage and there you should also consider this interclass variation the cat might not look uh, the same around the world, right? So how you do build an image classifier at first? You would define a function uh, if, if it's a Pythonic way, right? And then you would provide an image and you do some magic here. And then your output should be cat or a not cat, right? Uh, so unlike you know sorting list of numbers, there's no obvious way how you can hard code uh, for recognizing class, considering previously we see there's a lot of variation in the images. But attempts were made at first. Uh, you know, we saw about edges and you know the outlines uh, in the cat experiment at first in the 1950s uh, are the most important features uh, of an image where uh, you go, you know, uh, for the cat you could understand you know, pointed ears uh, and you know dark eyes and dark nose. Might signify it as a cat. So these are uh, very naive kind of features and uh, might work well on cat class. But if you want to add more classes to the same model, it might not work because you know most of the four-legged animal or you know cat uh, dogs are also has pointed ears and you know darker nose and eyes. So you would understand this would not work well. And then came you know the data-driven approach. So let's collect data set of images and labels and let's use a uh, classical machine learning models and train the classifier and we will use this classifier and see whether it works well on the new images so you would build now you know two different set of code uh, one for training images you would also pass the labels and then you would build the model and then you would use that model as input uh, and your test images, which is not seen by the model, and then you basically get the output labels. So uh, you know this is one of the ca categories called CIFAR10 dataset, which is uh, which is which is an example dataset, and most computer vision uh, researchers would you know uh, if at all you build a new neural network, you would first test on this, it will 
whether it will do well or not. It's like a benchmark data set. You can see there are different variation of aeroplanes and automobiles, uh, you know, bird, cat, and deer. You might see this is just an, you know, a uh, multi-class problem. There might be a multi-label inside a certain class. For example, there will be different kinds of birds. Whether uh, your problem at hand, uh, you know, requires multi-label approach or a multi-class is sufficient. So in Amazon, you might un uh, understand if you if you show, uh, you know, Amazon or any kind of e-commerce uh, website, you could upload an image these days, and then it would show similar products. So how it is doing? It's a multi Kind of a label classification if you upload a blue jeans pant uh, you would get relevant blue jeans pant and it might also show uh, you know recommendation also has been part of uh, the model so once you extract the features you could also recommend other products which might have similar features uh, for example under the jeans pant category the parent class is uh, you know the uh, pantaloons so the first classifier that we would see is probably the nearest neighbor. So the idea is to provide the training images and the labels, and the model would memorize all the data and labels. And given a new, you know, uh, image, you would compare each uh, that image with each of your training uh, image and find the most relevant uh, image. So how you would find the most relevant, we would see in the uh, in the coming slides. Uh, but you would find most similar training image and you will get the label of that image. So if the features are similar, then it's more highly likely that the new image that you have uh, testing belongs to that particular category. So uh, CIFAR 10 data set has you know, 10 classes and 50,000 training images and test images. I will see uh, there is, if you build a such a kind of uh, nearest neighbor model, uh, there's a lot of variation and you would see uh, at first in this in this in the second row you would see in the, uh, probably the fourth column the frog the nearest neighbor looks like a cat right uh, you might understand just the nearest neighbor might not work well uh, but attempts were made at first so how you would basically compare uh, the most similar image given a new image you would use distant metrics so you, this is your test image with pixel intensities and you have the training image you subtract using l2 distance or l1 distance uh, which is also called as manhattan distance and you get a difference of uh, absolute uh, value of your uh, pixel differences and you sum it up and you get a value if this value uh, is similar to one of the training images if it is yes then you would provide uh, the label category, label or the category of that image. Uh, if you just build a you know, rough code about it, uh, it's, you could see it's very uh, concise. You just have a training function and a predict function. And for the training function, you would memorize all the training data. And, and then for every test images, you would, you would basically, you know, it's not a learning algorithm. You would store all the images that that were uh, you know uh, that were shown during the training and then given a new image you would see the nearest image based on the distinct metric and then uh, predict that label so what's prop what is the problem with it right uh, if you could just compute uh, get, get the computation and how, how long it would take uh, for training you would need the entire data set to be stored and the entire data set uh, should be also available at the inference time. Consider uh, for the ImageNet, there were millions of images. So if you build a K nearest neighbor or, or a nearest neighbor now, uh, right on this model, you would definitely need to store all of those images and then query each and every image for your new image that you are trying to predict. So, uh, but this is the opposite that we really want. Uh, we we can afford you know training image uh, training type to be more and inference time to be very less. Um, so that's what uh, that's why that's one of the reason that nearest neighbor classifier most people are not using. Uh, you might see it might work with other you know uh, probably data set, but considering 
images are very high dimensional uh, data considering you have three channels and you know 2d images it's not something feasible um, you could consider a k nearest neighbor here uh, in, in order to overcome you know your nearest neighbor approach where instead of you know k uh, where you would k is the you know the number of neighbors that you would want to select before making the decision you could have uh, a naive way of you know having a majority voting if you are if you are neighbors three of your neighbors vote more uh, than the rest then uh, you would consider the majority vote and uh, that label would be your final uh, classification you would see at some of the points when uh, k increases um, you have the white decision boundary where uh, you not under uh, you, you would have equal votes and there's a tie between these three kind of different classes here you would see the different colored r uh, classes are uh, you know painted in different color and you have the points which are your training labels and you might have a new point uh, falling between in this space and you would con uh, you would basically use a similarity metric or a distance metric in order to uh, understand your neighbors and then make decision you see the k equals one uh, we call it as it's it's like overly fitting to your data set consider this particular yellow point uh, is an outlier right so but it has learned the outliers so it this these kind of models would not do really well but on the k equals three or five you would see uh multiple uh you know uh, there's less even though there's some you know misclassification but you could still afford to do that in you know in real time uh you know the accuracy of this kind of k equals one this model would be uh very much less and k equals three or five would generalize really well so uh it's not that just that you would have l1 kind of distance metric which is just an absolute difference you could also euclid reduce euclid difference right uh distance metric and you could see some you know changes uh you know the smoothening of the decision boundaries uh provided by the k nearest neighbor model and uh, as the k obviously uh probably you would select so how you would select k and also uh which of the one that you would select is it l1 and l2 um uh, this is again one of the parameters that that while building the models the developer need to select uh what is the best value of k what is the best distance uh metric that you are using we call it as hyperparameters these hyperparameters are also there for your neural networks it's very problem dependent and you need to a quicker way to do it is to try uh you know here it's just a you know few values of k and few values of uh, you know few distance metrics you could definitely try uh, each and every one and just see which one works the best um so in the process of tuning the hyperparameters which you will also probably do tomorrow in your uh, you know one of the hands off session uh, we have you know certain kind of ideas to uh, to do this either you would have your entire data set and you choose the hyperparameters that works the best on the data consider you put k equals 1 it might perfectly do well on your entire data set but you have your input data probably new data coming it will not do well and uh, the another bad way of doing is to have your train and the test have uh, your your data set split into train and test and you would choose the parameters which only works on your test data and you know the training examples will be seen by the you know, you know k nearest neighbor uh, classifier and on the test you would uh, you know tune those k and the distance metric probably and then uh, you do again you have the problem that you have no idea how the algorithm would work on the new data that you will be testing in real time so one of the good way is a, a better way is to split the data, your data set into train validation test test most of the deep learning you know approaches will do this 
you have train validation and test and validation set that is in LO that you would see will be used to tune these hyperparameters that you have at hand. And you would definitely not make the network C, your model C, your test set. Uh, and uh, this, this works really well. Uh, you would, you know, uh, provide the examples, training examples to your model and uh, at each, you know, iteration, each epoch that you would call, we would test it on the validation set and you will tune these K values or any of your hyperparameter values, but you will keep the test set as it is. You will not touch the set, the set until the, uh, the, the network is trained. At, at the last, you would test it on the test set and this is the, you know, the metric uh, that you will report in your research papers, uh, which was, which you will call it as blind test set or unseen data set, right? But uh, what if, if all the data comes from the same distribution, uh, it is it is highly and highly likely that the new data that you will provide to this trained model will also do well, which closely relates to your you know, test set. So a better way of doing in machine learning, uh, you know, is to do it via cross validation, uh, where you would split your data set uh, into again, you know, training, validation, and test set. But uh, the validation test, uh, you know, validation set will be in different folds. So you would first, at first iteration, you would uh, train it on fold one, two, three, four, and keep and tune the your hyperparameters on the fifth set and test it. Again, you will not touch it, and you have, uh, and that next iteration, you will train it on fold one, two, three, and five, and then fine tune your hyperparameters on four. And then once you do it for all the folds, here we have five folds. So this is called as five fold cross validation technique. You would do an average of your you know, error or the loss, and, uh, and then later you test it on your test set, how you, well your model is doing. So this might do well in your small data set, even on uh, image classification, but it will not scale well in your deep learning. You might need to wait, uh, you know, a lot in your training procedure if you are, you know, splitting your data set into cross validation. But it's a really good technique uh, to also, you know, prevent your model from overfitting, which means uh, it cannot generalize well for, you know, you know, unseen uh, examples. So if you do that, uh, you would, if you plot all the mean values uh, across different values of the K and you know, cross validation accuracy, uh, you would find a, a sweet uh, you know, spot uh, for a particular K that you will consider for, for a particular data set that the model has done really well. For example, here it's, it, it will be just summing. So, uh, one of the prob other problem that why people are not using traditional models such as Kenyer's neighbor is uh, it very it is very slow at uh, you know test test time you you might understand we might need to store the entire training uh, data set in order to query the new image and also the distance metrics are not quite informative here you can see there are different uh, you know, images which are visually, uh, you know, uh, distinct, but for the K nearest model, it's one and the same. All the three images that you would see here have the same L2 distance. So uh, we are not actually capturing with these kind of models uh, uh, a rich, rich uh, visual visual understanding. And there's also cuts of dimensionality. Consider uh, your points. Or the clusters of your points are very uh, very far, and you need more data, and you will increase the dimensions, and this increases the number of uh, you know the point data points, and uh, if you increase the dimensions, it will be also difficult for you to store and also process those kind of models. So in summary, uh, K nearest neighbor is not a it's a very naive way for you to build an uh, image classification model. And even if you build it, uh, you need to fine tune a couple of K and distant metrics. And we also saw 
how we could choose the hyperparameters using the validation set and uh, what were hyperparameters were and um, why distant metrics would not give you a very good understanding of your image. So later, uh, convolution neural networks came, uh, which which were able to, you know, uh, generalize really well on most of the data set. I would just use one of the uh, sources on the internet for better, you know, visualization. You have your in input image, and you have your uh, uh, you have you will do convolution operation on you know or your rgp classes and then you have your feature maps and once you have the feature maps you will do a pooling operation which you would see and then you have your fully connected network so as you can see convolution is an you know neighborhood summation and then uh, once you sum those and you also multiply with the values of your uh, kernel which we saw in the image processing you know, kernel example. And then you would, and the feature maps would look something like this. And once you get the feature maps, you could do most of the uh, other processes such as max pooling and average pooling, where max pooling, you know, uh, selects the maximum neighborhood uh, of, of those particular pixels and average pooling would average those pixel values. So this is just a down sampling procedure that people would use in order to make uh, you know train very efficiently. So the Linet architecture and uh, many most of the architecture in uh, CNNs would use either the max pooling or average pooling. And once you do max uh, pooling, you would get an you know reduced feature map that you would you know flatten uh, into an array, and then uh, these are fed into a dense neural networks. Uh, uh, you know, we call it as nodes, and these would extract further. You know, uh, you know, uh, this would basically classify at the output uh, into your specific uh, classes. So it's, it is possible to you know, design neural networks just with your input and output. And there's a formula for you to uh, you know, quickly decide uh, what should be your output size and input size. If at all, you could decide on that. You could definitely design a filter and you know, start and end of your uh, you know, the padding and the stripes, which you will see in the further illustrations. Uh, so I have uh, a convolution visualizer here. You would see uh, at each, if I just click on the one of the weight, which is here called it, uh, here called it, they call it as weight, but it's basically a kernel in image processing, that what are all the output and input images that are affected. And you could increase the padding, which pads pixels into the borders, and there's also st stride if you want to skip a particular uh, length of pixels. So we'll go. Uh, we'll just see a, a, a real time. You know how the CNNs would look like. So if you consider one of the image here, which is uh, a cup of coffee, which is an which belongs to an espresso class. You have red, green, and blue. And if you click on one of the, you know, convolutional kernel, uh, convolutional layer, you have, uh, you have an, you know, illustration of how the convolution works, right? And uh, you would see there are a lot of convolution kernels that were automatically learned. So whenever someone tells you that the networks are training, these are the kernels that are you know, randomize or uh, will be zero at first, and then you would, you know, extract different features. As you see here, going further, uh, it is less, less uh, it is very abstract for human eyes to understand what the particular image is, but uh, this is how the neural networks would uh, extract the features and understand. So there are like multiple convolutional layers, 
and at first and at last you would see the output as espresso uh, with the highest probability right uh, so one of the things that you would see here at each convolution layer uh, you would do an an operation and which is called as activation function uh, where you could see here it has replaced max of that particular value right uh, it is very evident probably here where you see the orange features are uh, are are not considered and then the blue edges are uh, weighted more right So if you see uh, one of the other you know, illustration how neural network works. So let's see uh, this is one of the uh, TensorFlow you know, playground in order to classify. Uh, it gives you an kind of tool where you can add more layers and then if you start training uh, whether the model could you know uh, classify. Right? This is pretty easy. Uh, you know, it did really well if you consider this particular data set, right? So you have the orange and the blue points. Now the task is for us to classify these images, uh, classify these two you know, points. So let's start with the neural network that worked for the other example. Uh, now you can see you have the training and the test loss. It's not really doing well in classification, right? But let, let's add a couple of more features. I'll also add uh, more layers and more neurons, which can you know uh, provide you different various diverse kernels, and these kernels would also we call it as weights uh, of a neural network. The model that you basically save is particularly uh, is basically the weights at each layers, right? And uh, have provided different features. In the form of you know feature transformation and let's see if it do does any good you could see it it's it's really trying to it's better than the previous so let's try to fit You see a lot of aberrations in the training and the test curves here, uh, right? And we could see this kind of okay. And after some, you know, iterations try to work well and then again you know uh, it's still yeah now you would see it's almost good but we would you know there are other you know these are the hyperparameters that you would see there are learning rate activation function regularization and uh, many other you know th the number of layers that you choose all are the hyperparameters. So we know how tomorrow you would see in uh, in detail in session how the data would be split into the you know training, test, and validation, and different hyperparameter tuning. This gives you an just an overview. So now, uh, once we you know we kind of got an overview of what CNN is and how they would. Uh, Make a classification. We would see what are the other tasks that CNNs can do, and uh, why are this they very why are they important, right? There, there's this classification, and there are these retrieval. So I give an image, and you basically get similar images from the database. There's also uh, object detection, right? As you see on on the right, on the left, and you have the segmentation. Where each pixel would be, uh, you know, uh, would be classified into a particular class. So 
so this this was a really difficult problem but nowadays uh it's almost solved so if you just talk about segmentation there are different types of segmentation you have semantic segmentation where each of the pixels will be assigned to a class and you don't necessarily you know draw a bounding box and localize that particular object here the cat but there is low classification and localization where you also classify that it's a cat but it all but you also you know not only uh, do that you also put a bounding box around it and you have object detection of you know multiple objects and there are also instance segmentation where each of the class uh, uh, even though these two are docs they are you know uh, they are different distinct instances or different examples or they are different uh, you know blobs so these are some of the you know areas of segmentation and uh, you know cnns are pretty much used in self driving cars for pedestrian even people there are like two different kind of branches whether you would use high definition maps or just uh, high de definition maps are your actual uh, 3d kind of maps uh, that you would feed again into the uh, neural networks inside the self driving car or just the computer vision models or you no know, deep neural network models are sufficient probably you would consider waymo and many other uh, self driving providers would use high definition maps but you know there are tesla and uh, probably the tesla we just use now um, you know computer vision models and they are not using any kind of pre built you know google uh, kind of maps or high definition maps which gives rich representation so they would be doing uh, object detection you know, segmentation on the go uh, right when the car is driving and now you would consider the complex uh, decision that you need to make uh, in order to drive a car and uh, this this is a gpu which looks like um, this is how it looks like where you can uh, mostly used in image and uh, video processing task so most of the models if you want to run you would need a decent uh, gpu these days and uh, we would see now uh, another task here is one of the neural network from simonian uh, called i3d it's a uh, two branch network for action recognition right as you can see there are different frames of images consider it said 1 second or a 2 second uh 2 second clip length and you would stack these images and then pass it through convolution layers and then hopefully you would have uh the feature learned during the training and then you would classify into different categories of action and you have a uh, you know pose estimation so pose estimation of objects of humans you know um, you could build an action recognition neural network just using the poses you might see a uh, colored you know skeletons or you know, skeleton joints uh, that are added uh, on to the original image and uh, we people also use in reinforcement learning in the first stage new uh, you know convolution neural networks for to again get an rich understanding of uh, you know game so reinforcement learning so uh, uh, mostly all the data sets mostly work on uh, the build on games where uh, the model should take independent actions depending upon you know different attributes in the games so at the first stage you would see a cnn for uh, to understand and to understand the pixels you also have uh, a lot of work going on in medical uh, you know domain where it, whether it is possible to detect uh, benign and malignant cancers or tumors um you know recently we saw a chest x-ray based model from um, google uh, which surpasses uh, 
you know, um, doctors who could detect pneumonia. Um, this, this, this should serve as a tool for doctors, you know, to, you know, minimize the misclassification rather than replacing. So that's how we would look at in the future, uh, uh, serving people, uh, providing computer vision models or deep learning, you know, machine learning models as a tool rather than a replacement. We, uh, you know, to increase probably the productivity or making, you know, better decisions at the, uh, for the problem at hand. And, you know, NASA has used, um, if you consider, you know, galaxies would be moving and you have different orientations. So how you would, you know, classify uh, same galaxies into, you know, given a picture, uh, whether you could extract from the huge databases of millions of uh, images uh, that this particular galaxy belong to this uh, set of images, right? Uh, so again, they would use convolution neural networks, and uh, you have for one of the subtasks in self-driving car is to understand the different traffic signs on the right. And uh, you know, these days, uh, uh, you know, it's been it's been already seven years, but there were there was an attempt to you know whether you could describe an image you know just using convolution neural network without any language information right and it is possible and uh, on the left you would see you know it, it is able to describe the image uh, as a white teddy bear sitting in the grass and or a man riding on on a wave on top of a surfboard and these days uh, the accuracy has uh, increased a lot thanks to you know language models also contributing and they will do a joint training of vision using the cnns or you know a better approaches such as transformers and also use you know transformer based uh, language models in order to have a better captioning uh, you would see live captioning these days on youtube or microsoft teams right so how it is possible um, you know you will also use speech modality um, and also languages and basically you could do a transcription uh provide as a transcription service there are like much more scope in computation and there are a lot of work going on um you might not uh probably know but one of the things that in the backbone for all the generative ai kind of models are again convolution neural network for example there are style transfer techniques that are used by artists uh, consider uh, this an input image you want to translate into a particular style so in order to extract features at the first uh, as a backbone they are using uh, cnns uh, even now right and uh, this is a starry night uh, which is a very well uh, you know technique and these kind of models are called style transfer models and on the right you would see uh, it's an diffusion, they call it as diffusion models, but again, in the background, in order to get a hyper realistic, you know, high re resolution images, they are using convolution neural networks, in particular called as UNET, right? In order to get an, uh, so the input would be a text prompts and they would, you know, from, from noise, you are able to generate these kind of images. Uh, but in the, in order to you know enhance these kind of images from lower resolution to a higher resolution you will be using cnns once again there is also other task of visual question answering so you give an image you ask a question so what do you see so uh, for example here where will the driver go if the uh, if turning right right it's an red so the car should not probably move and uh, you could build these kind of models along with cnns uh, to have a better understanding of the image so who for example here who is under the umbrella you would see uh, there are both the both the women are under the uh, umbrella and they have designed this task as a multiple choice right um, coming to you know practical so how the industry works like what are all the tools that we have where we can use these kind of 
images so uh, sorry, uh, this kind of methods how you can build it so earlier people were using cafe now you have pytorch and tensorflow uh, in the industry mostly pytorch and tensorflow are the extensively used frameworks in order to build you know, convolutional neural networks or deep learning models so uh, we have some of the case studies that i would just uh, give an overview so vggnet uh, came back in you know uh, 2014 it has 19 layers of you no know, repetitive uh, convolution input and convolution layer and max pooling for down sampling and again those inputs will be fed to the next convolution layer uh, sorry those outputs will be fed to the as input to the next convolution layers and it goes on uh, so why is this stacking so uh, if you ask stacking might not necessarily give you you know better results all the time right uh, the model might overfit so but there are ways that uh, if you have designed the neural network in a, in a uh, particular way you will extract most of the visual information from the images or particular data set right uh, there was this VGG 16 and then came VGG 19 with 19 layers. And uh, these were in inspired by the LXNet, which had a uh, few, you know, convolution layers and it, it was not very deep. So not necessarily mean deeper layers would give you better results all the time. It, it's, it depends on the problem at hand. And then came the ResNets. So they this was the first model which, you know, uh, surpassed uh, human uh, level accuracy on the image classification it has a 152 layer which is very deep you know uh, so they would understand that deeper layers at that time would not necessarily give you better accuracy so they came up with one of the solution called a residual connection where from the previous input you would uh, not you not just give the transformed you know uh, output to the next layer, you would also do a skip connection where you directly provide the input to the next, uh, you know, next block, right? This uh, that they observed the accuracy could match uh, with the shallow networks that they uh, previously uh, saw. Uh, even sometimes, you know, adding more layers would surpass uh, even the deeper net networks would uh, uh, were there at, at that time uh, there are a lot of object detection networks these days so tomorrow probably you will be you know using one of the pre-trained models to you know uh, fine-tune it on a new data set uh, most popular ones are vgg which we all already saw there is there are resnet which we just saw which has uh, you know uh, 152 layers and you have inception you have mobile net so mobile net as the you know name says is uh built taking into consideration for speed and accuracy there's always a trade-off in deep learning uh, if you build larger models they would work really slow in in the you know uh in real hardware so uh they used something called as separable uh, convolution depth wise separable convolution uh, which we will not go in detail but that particular you know uh, method enhanced where you, user can get to choose whether you want speed or the accuracy right and uh, so coming to uh, how co convolution neural network networks are you know whether they are robust or not uh, there are many uh, studies which shows you can easily fool neural networks with just one pixel there were multiple pixel attacks now there's a one paper on uh, uh, you know which talks about you they would they designed a method basically to selectively you know mask one of the pixels uh, in one of the layers and the network that this would fool a new, uh, neural network to consider uh to misclassify that image into a different class for example you would see uh i'm not sure if that is visible in the shape there's one white pixel here which was changed uh 
uh, and then the ship which is the ground truth label was changed into car and you would see the confidence of the prediction was really really high um, so it's a good thing that people are you know trying to break uh, the models this would also let us you know uh, understand how robust our models are and how how we can enhance um, so basically if you want to understand how you can have a, avoid you know uh, one pixel attack so you could have another neural network or while jointly while training your neural network you could also understand that particular change of pixels inside you know inside the neural network should not happen if you can provide those kind of examples of the one pixel attack your network would learn okay uh, this is an adversarial example which we call it as we call it as adversarial example which, which is trying to break the neural network and it would learn that and uh, that's how you would would make it more robust so they you they particularly you know in this study added a noise uh, which is not handcrafted but you know you have an algorithm which we could uh, which would give you know few which are the most probable you know pixels uh, if you add noise to those pixels the neural network would classify uh, one you know class to, to the other which is really really, really interesting so uh, i would like to you know and uh, our you know talk from the history to the present you know uh, our the present state of convolutional neural networks but have also added you know one of the recent architecture which came was transformers which is now widely used in in computer vision too so i would let the you know interested readers to check out uh, you know the transformer model and learn more, more about it so thank you uh, we can have you know questions It was really an informative session, sir. It gave us a uh, idea about the concepts that have been used in computer vision right from the very start to present. Uh, the demonstrations that you showed to the audience were truly fascinating. Also, uh, the way you connected the concepts to tomorrow's hands-on session was commendable. Uh, yes, sir. The session was really amazing, especially the examples which you gave. It uh, made really easy under to understand. Thank you so much. So moving on uh, towards the Q&A session. Uh, so audience, if you have any questions or concerns about the topic, feel free to post them in the chat box. Uh, so here is one question by Sanket Dhorpade. Uh, how CV is useful in the field of robotics based on manufacturing? So um, robotics is a you know wide field, and if you are talking about particularly manufacturing, you know you could build you know this uh, robots just for you know the supply chain kind of management where you get to you know transport raw materials for example amazon is now using smaller bots in order to you know sort your packages right and in the manufacturing if you sense you already have uh, you know uh, in the paint shop uh, while building automobiles there are robots which would you know uniformly paint the the you know surface of the the car uh, the bare models 
of the car you could enhance on the vision so provide more control tasks uh, there's an, there's this you know there will be robotic arms uh, and you know their joints needs to be controlled and you know their only sensors would be probably the vision right so how you make a uh, robot such as you know robotic arms which has a uh, uh, for for different kind of truck or you know different kind of automobiles uh, how you would make them smoothly paint or probably uh, you know brush surfaces uh, without damaging uh, itself and also damaging the part right so you would need to have a you know very good understanding of you know the surfaces of the you know the metal plates or you could use use it for precision cutting in manufacturing uh, um, using you know vision based models particularly I'm, I, I would like to point out one of the you know very difficult use cases that people have been working on was one of the makeup industries where you know you have these eyelashes uh, which were put directly by the robots you know without any manual intervention depending upon the style uh, for the beauty care right uh, it's not necessarily manufacturing but right uh, there are a lot of scope in uh, for robotics in manufacturing particularly in you know you know in the uh, we call it as autonomous mobile robots in mobile robots transport and ship packages sort them probably read the oc uh, you know the barcodes directly and sort into different categories you will also have you know mobile robots which could do bin picking uh, you have you know hundreds of boxes you need to pick the you know identify which is the easiest way to pick you can't pick it from the bottom right so you would have an visual understanding of the poses of the you know boxes that which is feasible to pick at first. And once you pick that, you keep it on the, you know, probably on the table, and then you would again run the algorithm, get the image, do, do those control decisions, get the most feasible uh, pick that you can do. I also see another question here. What if the object is too far from the range and we use high resolution camera for clear imaging? Does it will affect the overall identification of that object higher higher resolution will definitely give you you know rich understanding than you know blurry images and uh, but it's more like a balance these days uh, are your neural networks are really good are they robust to even blurry images and then you know are comparable to you know the features that are extracted from high resolution images you need to make that kind of decision so these days I would see uh, it would do really well. Uh, probably you might know YOLO is one of the models probably you might be seeing tomorrow in your hands-on workshop. Uh, there, are, there are these different versions of YOLO, recently a gold uh, a, a model called gold YOLO, which could real time, which can do real time tracking even at you know, smaller resolution or when the objects are really uh, far. So uh, we have another question from Ohm. How does YOLO handle multiple object detection in a single image, right? So uh, you basically, uh, YOLO will, you know, split a particular image into different grids. Consider you have a 50 cross 50 uh, kind of image you build into, you know, four different parts. And, you know, the main, so how the main task of the neural network here, the YOLO, uh, you, uh, it's called as you only look once, right? Uh, is to predict, you know, four different values, which is, you know, uh, the bounding boxes, their dimensions, uh, you know, height, width, and, uh, you know, the uh, height and width of your bounding box, and also the starting and the end pixels of those bounding boxes and also the last one is the confidence to which that particular bounding box would uh you know what what is the class of of the object that is con contained in those bounding box so uh that's how yolo does so it's an uh it's a really good model 
uh, which you, you know does uh, image you know, object classification, object detection basically, uh, which is based on you know uh, building different grids, and for each grid you would you know regress, you know you would predict the bounding boxes along with the class that the the you know the particular grid will belong to and then obviously you will have multiple bounding boxes for a particular grid so which one would you select you would select the one that has most intersection with the ground truth box so you will basically while uh, in object detection tomorrow you would see that for each uh, bounding box for example if there's an image you would also need to provide the dimensions or the bounding box which we call it as ground truth or the true labels so you would consider uh, the bounding box once you have multiple you know those kind of bowling bounding box in those grids you would consider the one that has the highest intersection over union so how those bounding box would overlap so the maximum overlap that's the correct prediction if there is minimum overlap you would just uh, discard it And we have another question from Aditi where we can train and test the accuracy of the computer vision code, right? Uh, as I told you, you have TensorFlow and PyTorch. And TensorFlow and PyTorch are really good frameworks for you know, uh, building uh, you know, deep learning models. And they have a lot of you know, tutorials and example codes that you can try on. I, I hope tomorrow's workshop will be really insightful for you to understand the uh, you know how actually it works in real world uh, you would basically code it and can i use multiple data sets in a program yes so uh, you might be knowing most of the models that we see today for example if you consider you know chat gpt right it has been almost trained on all of the twitter data sets most of the images of all the image data set. ImageNet was one data set that we saw. So you can have you know, multi-modal uh, modality in the sense text, images, audio, speech, uh, probably healthcare records, X-ray scans, HD maps, uh, different kind of modalities and different kind of data set. You could have just one neural networks. Obviously, you might know, but see how CNNs would do it. So uh, CMNS might do it, but it's not really well for different modalities. So you have a novel architecture called transformers, uh, which is really good to to uh, you know this parallelization and also uh, work on multiple multiple modality and different data sets. So I would suggest you know interested read, uh, participants to read on transformers and also CNNs and you know make the comparison and what works the best. So Ankit has also asked, what are some of the popular algorithms for object detection in computer vision? So we already talked about YOLO. You have a single shot you know, detectors. You have ResNet models uh, using residual connection that we saw the 152 layer model uh, also used in object detection. But you could also just check it out the you know the parent models you know the foundation models that everything was built on like the VGG net have the LX net which is open open source uh, you could take any kind of data set and just try uh, you know building networks on these data sets right uh, so these are the popular algorithms in CNN in transformers you have a separate domain for different modalities. If you are considered just on vision task, you have vision transformers explicitly made for visual task. So again, uh, you might consider you know transformers would understand sequence of images. So these images will be you know given an image would be split into different grids or patches, and you would feed you know this input you know these uh, patches of data into your transformer. Once it's done, uh, it also has you know very rich long-term understanding between the images basically you know uh, understanding the background so cnns are good at you know 
local understanding uh, of it of, of in, in the in the image right so how does yolo had <clears throat> handle multiple object detection in a single image right uh, so as i already explained yolo would have to split the given image into different gates and for each grid it would regress uh basically there's a prediction of bounding boxes and the confidences right so if at all it's a multi class problem so in the in the training you would provide so this particular bounding this particular image and this particular coordinates of the pixels belong to this particular task sorry this particular class right uh, so that's what the multiple object that you are mentioning i guess so so uh, multiple object means multiple class so uh, um, so yeah if you have thousand classes you could have you know you could also build yolo for multi label as i already explained for example different categories of shirt different categories of pants could definitely do it uh, or you could just if it's not uh useful you could just uh, use the parent classes which are just shirts and pants you know these are different objects right and uh, you might have different subcategories under a person class so person might be an adult uh, teenager toddler which you can collect data set and you don't need to build everything from the scratch tomorrow you will be seeing some a method called fine tuning where you can use the existing pre trained models which which is trained on different data set and you know you know fine tuning those weights or the kernels that we saw right on this particular data set of interest so if you can, can you know uh, collect multiple object data set then you could definitely try uh, yolo on, on on that there are many examples that you can find and we have another question from ankit um, where we can train and evaluate yeah we already answered that so all the you know if you consider pytorch or tensorflow you have you know apis or code already built for you you know uh, for accuracy and all the evaluation measures so typically we will use accuracy precision recall you know uh, intersection over union and mean average precision mean average precision is one of the uh, most widely used for object detection so uh ssp has suggested that uh suggest a way to train a convolutional neural network when you have a quite small data set right so uh, this is what the problem uh we tackle by using fine tuning so you train a larger network or use a pre trained model right and you know those last layers are the ones that are uh you know has the you know we call it as classification layer right you would basically remove that classification layer and now uh, you know the model has already learned probably image net 14 million images features it has learned you would feed your new uh, training images and but use the you know categories or labels on your small data set that you are talking over for example it might be a single class of cat to detecting cat in an image and uh, using this you know you could you you don't need to collect a large data but a subsequent you know some amount of data is really needed like we would have probably i would say 100 to 200 images is sufficient for a single class for you to fine tune an existing pre trained network uh, which probably you will be doing tomorrow so if you would like to attend tomorrow you will definitely learn how the fine tuning works uh, in in the forth forthcoming sessions right uh, i think uh, yeah have answered some of the questions if you have more questions please do let us know uh, thank you sir for addressing the questions i hope uh, most of the doubts have been cleared so uh, lastly i would like to thank you for joining with us today it was great having you with us now we would like to present to you token of gratitude from our side
Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you all particip participants and you know hosts. And I would like to thank you know IEEE, SIS, GST College, and all the organizers. Uh, I I am I am guaranteed that you know uh, the forthcoming sessions would be really helpful for you know build uh, you know your 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 journey into the neural networks. And today it was just an overview to give what this domain is about, right? And I would encourage the participants and also the you know interested readers to go through and do a lot of reading and implement models on your own. And there's a lot of scope in computer vision and deep learning domains. It will be definitely ubiquitous everywhere. Um, and I will also like to thank for uh, the invitation and the opportunity for me to uh, addressing. I would also like to thank Professor Biju uh, for you know uh, supporting students uh, from the IEEE. Uh, SIS GST College. Thank, Thank you, sir, sir, for joining. Uh, we got to know a lot about computer vision today. Thank you. So, attendees, we are now approaching the conclusion for the session. Uh, the last section of the session, which is dedicated to the quiz, you all will be getting the link for the quiz in the chat. Do attempt, do participate in the quiz. Give your best. The quiz will be based on today's session. So give your best You'll so that you make the top position in the scoreboard. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to enlighten the participants on the point system. Each webinar will consist of 10 MCQs, uh, 50 points, five points each. A scoreboard will be available at the end of the day on our official Instagram account, Discord server, and WhatsApp group. So, so uh, towards the conclusion, I would like to thank our streaming partner, StreamYard. On StreamYard platform, you may broadcast over social networks directly from your browser before choosing the premium plan. To gain access to more feature, it provides you with a free option that you may check out. Next step is HP. HP is our technical sponsor. HP is an American multinational information technology company headquartered in Palo Alto, California, uh, that develops personal computers, printers, and related supplies, as well as 3D printing solutions. And lastly, I would like to thank all the attendees, the participants for your active participation throughout the session. The concepts that you have learned today will be very useful for you for the next hands-on session conducted by IEEE SIS GST under CS track. Uh, so we hope to see you all at our next session that is on deep learning, uh, deep space communication at 3.30 PM. Thank you all. Thank you for attending.